Amen. All right, just a note, all scripture is from the New American Standard, unless otherwise stated or noted. The title of my lesson today is Take the Sword. Last time I taught, I talked about oil your shield. So as I had said then, we have been given an armor from God. And I'd like to first make note that the word, word, is in sword which I thought was very interesting because Pastor Mark has been talking a lot lately about a word from the Lord and also the sword of the Spirit is the word of God. So that was just a side, little side piece for you guys. I'd like to open with the scripture from Ephesians chapter 6 verses 11 through 12 and verse 17. The word of God says, put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Verse 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And, verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, my plan was, but we know what the Bible says about man's plans, that many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is God's purpose that prevails. So my plan was to talk about the sword and the helmet, but then when I started getting into the studying and preparing about the sword, I was like, man, I have enough with this. So the helmet will be for next time. But I just find it very interesting in verse 17 how it says, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So I said to Kevin yesterday, it says, which is the Word of God. So does that mean the helmet of salvation is also the Word of God, or is it connected? So as we started reading some things, there is a connection between the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. So the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. But then we wear the helmet, and then our mouth is involved with the helmet and even our mind, and we need to get the Word of God into our mind so that it can come out of our mouth. So there is a connection between the two. I'd also like to read from 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 38 through 39. And I want to read this because after my last lesson, Kevin said to me, there is a scripture about David and Saul giving him his armor. So I asked for permission for you to use it, because just in case he didn't want to use it for a lesson. But this is what the Word of God says. Then Saul clothed David with his military attire and put a bronze helmet on his head and outfitted him with armor. Verse 39 says, And David strapped on his sword, not David's sword, he strapped on Saul's sword, over his military attire and struggled at walking. For he had not trained with the armor. So David said to Saul, I cannot go with these because I have not trained with them. And David took them off. So just like I said when I was teaching about the shield of faith, our armor is our armor. God gives it to us. When we accept him as Lord and Savior, it's like he lays this armor before us and he tells us in Ephesians to put on the full armor, not just half of it, the full, all of it. And we see that this armor just because of what it says in Samuel. It was fitted, it is fitted for us. My armor is not fitted for Kevin. My armor is not fitted for Helen. My armor is fitted for me. 
because God knows his plans for me. He knows the works that he has prepared for me. And those plans and those works that I am to walk in, I need my armor, not Chris's armor or Pastor Mark's armor, to do what God has created me to do. Whether we like it or not, when God created us, he had in mind a specific things for us to do. We do have a choice, as I've said before, to walk in them or not to walk in them. But why wouldn't you want to walk in the plans that God has for you? The things that he has created for you to do. So verse 39, notice it says, had not trained with the armor. So this armor that God gives us that specifically is for us, he gives that to us in order to wear on the battlefield, on our training ground. Everything we do in life, every situation we encounter is training ground for us. And we are to put on that armor daily in order to be comfortable in it, to know how it moves with us. And that is why David had to take it off. One, it wasn't fitted for him. He struggled to walk in it. When we put on our armor daily, it is not a struggle to walk with our armor on. And when we put on that armor, each of those pieces is a representation of Jesus Christ. So in essence, we are putting on Jesus. So when we put on Jesus, Jesus becomes fitted for us, for who we are, for who our God created us to be. And we learn to move and sway with Jesus, with the Holy Spirit. We learn that when they go left, we go left. When they go right, we go right. When they go straight, we go straight. There is an assurance, there is a confidence that we grow in in our walk with the Lord which goes back to our faith. Verse 12 in Ephesians chapter 6 tells us why we need the armor. It also, in verse 11, tells us that we need to stand firm. And in verse 12, it says we need this armor because we need to stand against the schemes of the devil, and it tells us what our struggle is against that it's not against flesh and blood. Sometimes we create our own struggles that we don't have to if we would just surrender. But it says that our struggle is against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. The wickedness. That is Satan and his little army. Because he does not want us to surrender. He does not want us to be confident or bold in our steps when we're walking with Jesus Christ. Because then when we are, we become a threat to his existence within our life. You know, I wanted to include the helmet of salvation because with the helmet, it protects our mind. He loves to feed our mind with the lies of one, lies of who God is, lies of who we are or aren't, and the lies of us being able to do it without Jesus Christ. Satan also lies to those who are not a child of God, who have not accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and he lies to them in the fact that, oh, everything's all right. I don't have to follow the Word of God. That, that was written like thousands and thousands of years ago. How does that apply to me today? 
He lies to them that everything is going to be okay. He even lies to Christians who have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, but do nothing to grow in their relationship with God. You know, everything that God touches, he will grow it. He produces it. It expands. So in our walk, if we are in the same place we were 10 years ago, it's not okay. We need to go back and we need to see where have we not loved the Lord with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We know that an offensive weapon is something that inflicts physical injury upon another. A defensive weapon is protective. It protects us from real or perceived danger. Well, if you're in a battle, an actual battle, that's real danger. So a sword can either be offensive or defensive just based on the definition of those two words. So I want to go back and look at the sword back in biblical times. So the Hebrew word for sword is machara, which means a short sword or dagger, a small sword for a cutting stroke. It was a weapon for making or repelling an attack. It inflicted more damage than the larger swords and it was easier for a soldier to handle in battle. It varied in length from 6 to 18 inches. And it was the common sword used by Roman soldiers in hand-to-hand -hand combat and was carried in a sheath attached to the belt. And it was common because it was lightweight. So they could move better with it. A skillful soldier used it to deflect the blows of his enemy. So I, I'd like, this is not in the notes, but I want to um, look at 1 Samuel 17, and I know we read from verses 38 through 39, but I want to look at verses 40 and 45. Because it said, a skillful soldier used it to deflect the bows of his enemy. Now what happened when when David put on Saul's armor is he could not move in it because it had not been fitted to him and he had not trained in it. But in verse 40, 1 Samuel 17, talks about that David took what his armor was, which God had trained him with, which was his staff. He got five smooth stones and his shepherd's pouch and his sling. That was David's armor at the time. And then what did he do in verse 45? So Goliath had approached him, and, and Goliath, you know, he's tall, and he's looking at David like, really? Like, you're going to come to me. You have no armor, and here I am. I have my armor bearer in front. I'm a big guy, and I have all my battle dress on, and here you are <laughs> with nothing but a staff, a sling, and whatever's in your little pouch. But then David had something that Goliath did not, and it's something that we have that those who do not know the Lord, they don't have. And this is what David said to him. I come to you in the name of the Lord of armies, the God of the armies of Israel. He had God. He knew what God wanted him to do. He was comfortable in his armor. You could say he was comfortable in his relationship with the Lord, and he had his staff and his sling and his shepherd's pouch. Because God had used that to train him as he was out shepherding the flock. Armored swordsmen 
would try to get really, really close. And that is why they had those little swords, because when, when they were that close, that combat became personal, because really it was your existence or theirs. It was a matter of survival. Fighting men relied upon chosen personal arms with which they were intimately familiar. Don't you love that? Intimately familiar. So you may sit there and say, well, you know, that was in the Old Testament, and there were no Roman soldiers walking around here in 2021, but we are in the army of God. We are a child of God. We are a warrior. God has said so in his word. So because God has said that, we are in a battle. Ephesians even tells us what the battle is against. Is Satan behind every single bush? No, but he's out there. And if we walk around in life that he's not behind every single bush, then we will not be prepared for when we come upon a bush that he's behind. It is a preparation. We cannot just come to church on Sundays, sit in the pew, or sit at home, listen to the church service, and do nothing with our walk Monday through Saturday, and then have an expectation that God is going to use us in a mighty way. It doesn't work like that. It takes work. There are things that are required for us to do. Soldiers just did not put on their armor. Not only did they wear their armor, but they had to take care of their armor. So we need to take care of ourselves in our walk with the Lord. The sword was one of the last two pieces that the soldier took. Interesting enough, in the research that I did, the other piece that was put on last, the last two pieces were the helmet and the sword. So how did they take care of their sword? After each use, they would wipe it clean, and then they would oil the sword before storing it giving the sword a coat of oil or grease after bouts would make a great difference in its ability to not rust, which makes sense. Many sheaths of the Middle Ages would be lined with wool, fleece, fur, or linen that could be saturated in oil so that when the sword was drawn and when it was sheathed, a new coat of oil would be applied. Now, when I was reading that this morning, as I was going over the lesson, the oil and the Holy Spirit. And what did they do to take care of their shield in battle? As they would oil it so it wouldn't get dry. Just as I talked about that last time I taught, is that we need to oil our faith. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to work in us and through us so that we do not become dry. And just as the soldiers oiled their sword so it would not rust, we need to also keep our sword oiled so it does not rust. Now you may say, but you said the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. So how can the Word of God rust? Well, if you leave it up on a shelf unopened, it's going to rust. What use of it? What use is it if it's up on the shelf collecting dust? Or if it's a little decorative item on your coffee table or on your side table. What use is it if you don't open it and read it? Everything we talk about always goes back to spending time in the Word of God, spending time in prayer, spending time in His Word to get to know the Lord, to get to know His characteristics, who He is, and also getting to know who we are in Him. They would also sharpen their sword. A dull sword did not work as well as a sharp one. 
we need to sharpen our sword. We need to sharpen the word of God within us. We need to allow the oil of the Holy Spirit to flow over us so that when trouble comes and when situations come that we need to lean heavily into Jesus, the word of God will flow up and out so that we can come against the enemy when he tries to bring lies into our mind, into our heart, into our soul, when he tries to, de to destroy us. Because he will try to. The word of God says the enemy comes to still, kill, and destroy. So let's look at the sword of the Spirit. We know it as the word of God. We also know from Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, that the word of God is living and active. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, even penetrating as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. If we are not in the word of God daily, how are we going to have our thoughts and intentions of our heart judged? How is God going to be able to deal with us with what we need to get rid of and replace with him if we are not spending time with him, listening for his voice and in his word? Because he will use his word to guide us. It is a roadmap of what we need to do in our walk. John MacArthur of Moody Press said this about Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. But is emphasizing again the precision that comes by knowledge and understanding of specific truths. Come to the knowledge and understanding, able to judge thoughts and intentions of the heart. That is what the Word of God does. I like the word precision. Precision. That is a skilled soldier. We learn how to precisely use the word of God. We learn when to use it in battle against the enemy. We learn when to use it as an encouragement to a fellow brother or sister in Christ or one that we are trying to witness to and lead to the Lord. We need to be intimately familiar with our sword, the word of God. As we become intimately familiar with the word of God, our relationship with God and, of course, the Holy Spirit will become more intimate. I mean, it's inevitable. If you think about the more time you spend with someone that you don't know, your friendship begins to grow. And normally you begin to take your guard down and share aspects of your life that is very intimate. When we are intimate with God, there is a sharpness and a powerfulness we are able to defeat spiritual forces in the heavenly realms. That comes with spending time in the word and in the presence of God, getting to know him better and even getting to know who we are in Christ Jesus. John 14, 12 says, Truly, truly, I say to you, the one who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do, because I am going to the Father. That is why we need to be in the Word. That is why we need to be learning Scripture. That is why we need to become intimate with our sword. Because in John it says that we have the capability of doing greater works than Christ did because he went back to the Father. You know, until Acts 2, they did not have the Holy Spirit with them how we have the Holy Spirit with us. 
So we have something that those in the Old Testament never had, but yet they were able to rely and lean on and walk in a power that came from God, and they didn't even have the Holy Spirit with them all the time. We do, because we are the temple. We know we are the temple, and the Holy Spirit resides within the temple. We need to read it so we know how to use it in any situation. 2 Peter 3.18 says, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Reading is only the beginning of knowledge, which leads to understanding and wisdom. If we do not know the Word of God well, we will have problems defending against the, attack of defending against the attacks of the devil. Like I said before, we need to be a skillful soldier. And we only become skillful by being in his word and spending time with him and surrendering to what he wants us to do. And most likely we aren't going to like what he asks us to do. When he gives us that word, we may not like what he reveals to us as he you know, through the word that he gave us. There is power, power in each word from God. That's why God said in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9, Hear, Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And this is what God was telling Moses to tell the people of Israel. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And then verse 6 goes on to say, These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart, and you shall repeat them diligently to your sons, and speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk on the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Verse 8 says, you shall also tie them as a sign to your hand, and they shall be frontlets on your forehead. You shall also write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. This scripture, even though it is from the Old Testament, is for us today. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We know that. And since God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, that means his word that we read today is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So in verse 6, it says, I am commanding you today. Take that, that he is commanding us today to repeat his word diligently, to speak of his word when we are in our house, when we are walking, when we are lying down, when we get up. We are to put it on our hand, on our forehead. We are to write it on the doorposts of our house and on our gates. How about on the doorposts of our house and on the doorpost, on the gate, the gate that opens to our heart. We write it on our mind, and we write it on our heart. We need to know when to use the Word of God as a weapon. Billy Graham wrote, two Greek words are commonly translated word in English. Now, we did read this about what John MacArthur said. But Billy Graham took a different spin. John MacArthur was specifically talking about Ephesians 6.17. Billy Graham is talking about the whole Bible. Two Greek words, commonly translated word in English. The first is logos, describing the Bible as a whole. The second is rhema, which means saying of God. It refers to a passage from the whole word of God that has application in our lives. Here's something important to realize. The Bible is not just the sword. It is filled with an arsenal of little swords, little daggers. The cool thing about this Bible is this Bible is my granddaddy's. So this Bible is what he used 
I think it has a date in here, like in the 40s that he was given it, which is pretty, like, wild. So he used this Bible. It's very worn and torn. But this was his arsenal of, of little swords that he used. That is what it, it's just not one big sword. It's a bunch of little swords, a bunch of little personal daggers. Because when we come in contact with the enemy and when we are in battle with the enemy, it is personal. It becomes between him, the enemy, and us. And this Bible provides us with all the ammunition that we will need in our walk. All the ammunition that we need to take the offense. If you want to know what the best way is to use the sword of the Spirit, go and read the scripture about when Christ was in the desert. He had been sent there by God. Because it says the Spirit led him. So he led Jesus to the desert to be tempted by the enemy. And what did Jesus do? He used his arsenal of weapons that he had from the word of God. We need to be like Eleazar. We must cling to the sword of the Spirit even if everyone is going the other direction. We are to cling to the words that are in this book that God gives us for situations when they arise in our life so we can cling to the word, cling to the actual words that God spoke. In 2 Samuel 23, verses 9 through 10, it tells us about Eleazar, how he He was one of David's mighty men, and he rose up and fought the Philistines, and he fought them until his hand clung to the sword. And what did the Lord do? He brought him victory. Cling to the word that the Lord gives you. It will bring you victory in an area of your life. Because when we cling to the word... We are surrendering to the word. If we aren't clinging to the word, we are clinging to our own self-will. To our own will. We are trying to do it in our own power. When we cling to the word of God, we are clinging to the power that comes from that word because it is the spoken word of God himself. Also, how... Eleazar clung to the sword. In Ephesians, we're told to stand firm. I would say as he clung to the sword that he was pretty much standing firm. You stand firm in what God has given you. So as I was preparing for this, I thought, there are some verses in Proverbs that talks about our tongue as a sword. So in Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18, and you could Google, either go on biblehub.com and put in search, do a word search for tongue or Google the word scriptures that have tongue in it. There's many more than just this. But Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18, this is the NIV. The word of God says, the words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. The New American Standard says, There is one who speaks like the piercing of a sword, but the tongue of the wise promotes health. We can either use the word of God to bring healing and health, or we can be reckless with it. We have a choice. That's why we need to know when to use the word of God as a weapon. There are times in our lives that things may not go our way. During those times, we need to be careful not to use the word of God as a weapon to inflict hurt or damage on another when we should be bringing healing. 
We need to use our tongue to declare and prophesy life over things that seem dead. We need to use our tongue to call into existence the things that don't exist. My question to you is, what are you calling into existence with your words? With the sword of the Spirit, how are you using the Word of God? What are you calling to, into existence with things you are hanging on to? It doesn't even have to be audible. It can be inaudible. Is it stress, grief, anger, unforgiveness? So you may say, well, how do I take the sword? Because in Ephesians it says to take the sword. We take the sword by memorizing scripture. 2 Timothy 3.17 says, so that the man or woman of God may be fully capable, equipped for every good work. Psalm 119.11 says, I have treasured or hidden your word in my heart so that I may not sin against you. We take the sword by meditating on scripture. Psalm 1, 2 says, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. That word meditates means to moan, growl, utter, speak, audibly and inaudibly, the word of God over and over and over and over again. Just as Jesus did when he was in the desert. He spoke the word of God over and over and over. If you have to use the same scripture a hundred times in a day, use the same scripture. God will give you one of the arsenals, one of the little daggers from his word to use in the situation. Write it down. Keep it with you. Write it on your hand. Write it on, don't write it on your forehead. I mean, you could. That could be a witness to other people. But write it on your hand if you have to. Make it where it is there so that when you feel the enemy come, because he will, you can say back, you are a liar. The word of God says, da, 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 da. We can take the sword by studying scripture. How do you study scripture? Take notes. Use tools such as BibleHub.com or a concordance or even reading commentaries or other books so that you can better understand the meaning of words. Spend time in the presence of God. Pray in the Spirit. Read his word. I have listed on there, unpack the verse. So one of the big things at school that they like to say is unpack the standards. That means like get everything out. Let's find out about what everything is in the standards that New York State wants us to do. So unpack the verse. Go through each verse. Look up the meaning of each verse. When you start looking up meanings of words and then you take those meanings and plug them into the verse and then read it, it takes on a whole different meaning. And it will take on the meaning that God wants it to have in your life. So in closing, I want to say to you, arise you prince and princess, you child of God, you mighty warrior, anoint your shield and take your sword. In Jesus' name, that is all I have. Have a blessed week.